City of Stevens Point Common Council Meeting, recorded June 20, 2022. I have 7 o'clock. We will call the regular Common Council Meeting of the City of Stevens Point to order. Clerk, can you please get a roll call? Christensen. Here. Shore. Here. Hemer. Here. Zarazua. Here. Johnson. She is joining us remotely. <coughs> Carlson? Here. Kneebone? Here. Shuda? Here. Dalton? Here. Fischler? Here. Morrow? Here. And uh, that is for Please join me in our salute to the flag. Saturday and Sunday with fireworks on Sunday and the 4th of July parade which is Monday uh, will be at noon that is not put on uh, by the downtown businesses this year that is going to be Joe uh, Alexander who works at Lendudas Motors in conjunction with the city we're partnering on that so if you're interested in registering a float for the parade walking in the parade or you want to volunteer to help with the parade uh, you can go to our website and find Joe's contact information, or you can call my office. So I want to thank Joe and his team for stepping up and taking over the 4th of July parade that is absolutely critical in our community. Uh, we've got some good headliners. That whole schedule for Riverfront Rendezvous is available on StevensPoint.com. Um, I also had brought some brochures in. They're freshly printed. And uh, if you want to, take one of those with you for that schedule. And number three, mayors who wish to address the council and on a, or mayor and council on a specific agenda item other than a public hearing must register their request at this time. Those who wish to address the common council during a public hearing are not required to identify themselves until the public hearing is declared open by the mayor. We do not have any public hearings on the agenda, so anyone who wishes to speak on any of our agenda items need to register now. Oh, I'm still muted. Look at that. Sorry, everyone. I, I was looking for entry, people coming in, but um, all right. We should be good now. Everyone can hear us, yes? All good, Mayor. Perfect. There we go. Loud and clear. All right. Um, so with that, is there anyone wishing to speak on an agenda item that has not yet registered? Anyone online wishing to speak on an agenda item? Just let me know the agenda item and we'll get you on the list. Okay, I am not seeing anyone online wishing to speak on any of the agenda items. So I will, oh, yes sir? Uh, yeah, uh, can anyone hear me? You write this down? Joshua Rosencrantz. Yes, please. If possible, I'd like which to item speak number? On, uh, item number. Sorry, let me. I gotta scroll down here and find it. Please bear with me. Sorry. Um, item number seventeen, please. Okay. Anyone else? All right. We can if you could bring those up, please. And Joshua, thank you. As I said, we're going to move item number five up. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Stevens Point Housing Authority. Where is President Doc? There, there he is. 
and uh, Idowu uh, approached the lectern and whoever else is going to be involved in making this presentation, um, join her please. So first, I'd like to also bring up the three members, uh, two from the department and a Mid-State Technical College intern uh, to be with us up here as they receive their awards. So Lieutenant Mark Schoberly, Firefighter Paramedic John Clements, and our Mid-State Technical College intern Riley Kate. We, uh, I received a contact from the Stevens Point Housing Authority and uh, they wanted to present some awards for some actions that these three members took last October in 2021 at a fire scene. And they felt it was appropriate to present this in front of the Common Council. I agreed and the Stevens Point Housing Authority is going to present some awards to these three members this evening. With that, okay. with that, I'd like to take everyone back to October fifth, two thousand twenty one, and read this to you guys. On October 5th, 2021, ACRE responded to a call for a general fire alarm as well as an EMS alarm sounding at 1300 Briggs Court in apartment 312. Upon arrival, it was determined that there was a working fire on the third floor of a high-rise building. Engine One's crew, consisting of Lieutenant Mark Schoberly and Firefighter Paramedic John Clements, and Mid-State Technical College Fire intern Riley Kate made entry to the building with a pressurized water can, hand tools, and ascended to the third floor. When they reached the third floor of the building, they encountered smoky conditions through the entire third floor with decreased visibility. After making entry into room 312, they encountered heavy, thick, black smoke and high heat conditions. Engine one crew began a primary search of the apartment for the seat of the fire as well as any possible residents knowing there was a high probability that someone was still trapped in that apartment. While doing a primary search of the apartment, Lieutenant Schoberly found an unconscious victim and with the assistance of firefighter paramedic Clements and intern Kate, they dragged her to the entryway of the apartment where firefighter paramedic Clements proceeded to pick up the victim and fireman carry her down three flights of stairs and handed her off to the awaiting med crew. Firefighter paramedic Pete Ostrowski and Shane Westfall treated and transported her to St. Michael's Hospital. The patient was alive but in critical condition at the time of transport. Despite the extreme adverse conditions of this situation, I personally believe the actions taken on that day by Lieutenant Schoberly, Firefighter Paramedic Clements, and Intern Kate distinguished the crew and their performance to search and rescue an occupant from a third floor of a high-rise fire and suppress the fire. Their outstanding performance presents the core values of the Stevens Point Fire Department and all we stand for. We are fortunate to be able to call these men and women brothers and sisters of the fire service. With that, all three members, or two members in our intern, will be receiving a Distinguished Service Award from the Stevens Point Housing Authority. It reads, for their distinguished service under adverse conditions in their performance of duty on October 6, 2021, in the search and rescue of an occupant from a third floor of a high-rise fire 
and fire suppression activities. Everyone. Hi, my name is Idowa Dadasu, and I'm the executive director for the Stevens Point Housing Authority. I'll keep my remarks brief, but we just want to recognize the first responders on that day, including the fire department and police department. We, in high rise manor, there are 73 one bedroom apartments, so all tenants were evacuated and unharmed, unfortunately, except the tenant that lived in the fire unit. So, we really want to just thank them um, for their bravery and making sure that everyone um, was evacuated from the building safely. And for that, we thank you for your service. Okay. Um, could all three representatives come forward? George Dockstader, Chairman of Stevens Point Housing Authority. I'd like to thank you three for your distinguished service on a high rise, seven floor building, like you said, she said, 73 apartments. And this worked flawlessly for the city between fire, transit, ADRC, everybody came together. We got everybody out of the building, transported them to ADRC and got them food, got them their medicines, got them back in their homes that night, except for the two apartments that were ruined. So, with that, So with that, I would just like to say one more time, these members were involved in this seven-story high-rise fire, but there were many others involved in that fire as well. And while everyone was doing their job, they were doing it well. And they exceeded my expectations, and that's important for everyone to understand here. We have an acronym in the Stevens Point Fire Department, and it's the price of doing business. And that signifies our core values. And I believe not only these three, but every other member that was present at that fire that day were exceeding all of those values. And that's professionalism, respect, integrity, compassion, and excellence in all we do. And all of these members proved that that day. And that's why they're here today in front of all of you receiving this award. So again, congratulations. Chairman, Director, and of course the men and women of the Stevens Point Fire Department. Thank you all very much for attending. With that, I'll give you a moment if you want to um, go on the hall for pictures. Or if you really want to stay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, uh, with that, we will move on to what is now item number five. Um, persons who wish to address the mayor and council for up to three minutes uh, regarding a non-agenda item. Mr. Kudruski, you have registered in favor but not speaking and registered against but not speaking. So you're not speaking? <laughs> number four and number five. All right. I know five is four again. That one decided which side of mine you have to go. What? Keith Krauski, 1536 Water Street. Just want to have been here well. Thank Dean and Ron for giving us some voice of sanity in this room. So we're gaining on it. Just was out driving around, saw this yard sign in a Alder's yard, and it says, "Let me get this up here." 
just say no to higher taxes, vote no. And referendum. I guess they're, I don't know if they have a pact or what they have here. Understand it's one of our alders, the usual alder suspects, Mary and Tori. Just say no to higher taxes. In April, this alder had a referendum on the county board side that raised my taxes because she wanted a new building down on Water Street for the, for the health care center. So she's willing to raise taxes on me there. Here she's accusing people where there isn't a tax increase of having a referendum that's going to increase taxes. It's just utter insanity how this person works. Of course, I've seen their financial records, so it doesn't surprise me. I think about financial, their financial prowess when they totally, with Dave's ability to not listen, when they shoveled Stanley Street bike lanes in to the tune it was supposed to be 90,000 they did such a great job that I think it cost the city. I'm not sure. I wasn't here, I don't think. I think they pushed it to the tune about 260. That's how good they are at taking care of our finances. These are people screaming about the referendum. We have tried to control the gross spending that's done, led by her virtually all the time, and Dave. So just saying. This isn't, there's nothing about an increase in tax on it, yet her sign says that while well, she had the, the hypocrisy to raise my taxes with the referendum she pushed at the Portage County level. So, thank you. Thank you. Dave Iden? If I, if I, if I can correct the record very quickly. Um, the you know, Alderperson, this is the public uh, comment period. You wish to speak? Can register ahead of time, but this is the public comment period. You did have some numbers wrong there, Mr. Kudrowski, okay. and I'll, I wasn't I'll, sure I'll tell you that for sure. Numbers, so. um, and I believe that's what the older person is referring to. Dave Iden? Good evening, all. Dave Iden, 1008 Matilda Street. Um, in reference to the sign that uh, Keith had pointed out, I guess it's it's kind of disingenuous when you're going to come right out so blatantly and claim that uh, we want to hold taxes down when I don't think anybody in this body who's been in this body for some time has ever been concerned about taxes on constituents or taxpayers or, or city residents. Uh, that being said also, I think there's still no clarification in regards to uh, options from the two lane to four lane road, which is being pushed forth here in regards to the majority of the city council. We still don't see an option for the four lane in the costs or the two lane in the costs. So uh, I, you can claim some things on your sign which nobody can understand simply because it, it's been withheld from us. There's been a veil of secrecy around a lot of these things too regarding this project in particular. So the signs, I don't know, I have a problem with the signs because it's, it's not the truth but yet you want to tout it as such to oppose what you've opposed all along. The members of the community and the city who oppose this, which are the majority, even though you want to deny it because you don't represent the way you should. Uh, that being the case, you know, there's, there's a problem there. I'd like to really see the numbers, but it's been under wraps forever. So that being the case, uh, I'd urge everybody to seriously consider voting for this referendum and, and then we can hold the city accountable to costs and spending and road projects, which here again, that would be a, a centerpiece of our community. Show where we stand. I'd like to think the Common Council again would consider listening to what the taxpayers and the citizens have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And that exhausts our uh, speaker list for the public comments. Clerk, uh, was there, there a political action committee legally registered for that? There is not. It's actually considered a referendum committee uh, opposing the referendum. They do not have to register until they hit a certain dollar amount threshold. Once they reach that, they have 10 days to register. Thank you. And Alder Shore, I apologize, but yes, those were the numbers you were referring to, the, the Stanley no, Street well, numbers? I, uh, 
I just we wanna... purchased no. We purchased uh, equipment uh, at the time of the Stanley Street restriping, and so uh, actually uh, it more than paid for itself because we did it ourselves. Stanley Street was actually under the original budget because we bought the equipment. It wasn't I think at ninety thousand dollars, and then the the two hundred sixty thousand that you mentioned was for the tap grant, which was the fourteen miles of bike lane. Thank you. So yeah, the numbers were mixed up there. Yeah. Okay, um, with that, our uh, speaker list there is exhausted. We will move on to the consent agenda. Is there any older person that wishes to pull anything from the consent agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Moved by Christensen to approve, seconded by Dalton. Discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Christensen? Aye. Shore? Aye. Keemer? Aye. Zarazua? Aye. Johnson? Sorry, yes, I'm here, thank you. Carlson? Yes. Nibone? Aye. Shuda? Here. Dalton? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Fischler? Aye. Tomorrow? Aye. And that is approved. Item number seven is a resolution joining the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition, spelled wrong. Yeah. It should say coalition. Other Kimer, I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, we have a second? A second. Uh, we'll give the second tomorrow. Discussion there. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alder Shore. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm glad to see this. Um, I was involved uh, in um, the initiative for the community to become part of the Green Tier Legacies communities. Um, and uh, for a while, until uh, we got the staff help, um, was compiling the uh, scorecard um, that we uh, need to turn in annually. Just a couple thoughts on you know where our opportunities are. Um, when I was more active in that Green Tier Legacies, uh, I was watching some other communities um, do some very ambitious things with regard to climate action, um, about setting you know goals for reducing the carbon footprint. Um, and I was sort of thinking about what we could do, realized that some of that would be difficult for us. Um, uh, and so things that I um, would be excited about, uh, I would love to see us uh, have a, a way to um, monitor our kind of total miles driven. Um, that's not a simple thing to do. I know um, you and I, uh, Mr. Bayer, were in discuss had discussed uh, several times maybe a system for tracking energy use um, by the city's own uh, buildings and, and vehicle fleets. And then just as a last thing where I really see an opportunity. Um, so the science is telling us that uh, if you can get shading, shade trees um, over 40, 50 or more percent, this is on a spot basis, um, and you know, in certain places, you just look around the city and kind of see how much uh, shade coverage there is. You can really uh, make a difference in um, uh, sort of um, remediating some of that temperature increase and, and uh, have a real cooling effect. So I'd love to see us do you know, more shade in key places that are paved. Um, thank you. Great. Anyone else? This resolution in particular, this group, um, was something that I was interested in because it we've acted pretty well locally. However, what this does is it's a group of uh, like-minded communities requesting that the state and federal government remove the restrictions that are typically put in place by local or formal local municipalities to make the decisions they need. There are things that we can't do because the state or federal government says we can't. Um, so I think this is going to be very impactful helping clear some of those barriers uh, that stand between us and doing sustainable things. So thank you for that. Any other comments? Hearing none, clerk, would you please call that roll? Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Nebone. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Shore. Aye. Christensen. Aye. And that is approved. Item number eight is a resolution. That's a request from Drew Bain, representing the Wisconsin Public Service Corporation, for a conditional use permit to perform upgrades to an electrical substation located at 3214 Hoover Road with the parcel identified in your packet consistent with chapter 23.02 sub 1 sub a sub 3 sub b. I make a motion to accept the request from Drew, Bra Drew Bain uh, representing the Wisconsin Public Service Corporation for the conditional use permit. Thank you, Alderman Carlson. 
Seconded by Dalton. Discussion there. Hearing none, clerk, roll call please. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And that is approved. Item number nine is a resolution a request from Tyler Ignatowski for a conditional use permit to construct five duplexes on three unaddressed parcels bounded by the North uh, Point Drive, Georgia Street North, uh, with parcels identified in your packet, consistent with Chapter 23.01, Sub 13, Sub F. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Zarazua. I'll second. Seconded by Nebo. Discussion? Hearing none. Clerk, please call that roll. Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Shore. Aye. Christensen. Aye. And that is approved. Item number, number 10 is an ordinance amendment, a request from the City of Stevens Point to amend the official street map of the City of Stevens Point for the purposes of extending Union Street to the north of Maria Drive and extending Academy Avenue to the west within the parcel identified in your packet. All tomorrow so moved. Motion to approve by Morrow. Second. Second by Zarazua. Discussion there. Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And that is approved. And number 11 is a resolution, a request from Brooke Claysmith, representing Inclusa Incorporated for a variance sign variance to construct a freestanding sign at the property located at 2801 Hoover Road, parcel identified in your packet, which is consistent with chapter 25.14. All the persons there Zua will be abstaining as she works for one of the people who will be on the sign. I make a motion to approve the request from Brooke Claysmith uh, for the sign variance at 2801 Hoover Road. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Fischler. Keely Fischler, yes. <laughs> It's funny because I look at Makira and then Keely. I'll get it right eventually, I'm sorry. Uh, motion to second, discussion. Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Johnson. I think that was an aye. It looked like it. It was the timing. Yeah. It wasn't need an aye, thank you. Okay. Zerazua uh, stained. Uh, Keemer? Aye. Sure. Aye. Christians. Aye. And the motion passes. And number 12 is a resolution, a request from the City of Stevens Point to seek membership in the AARP network of age-friendly communities. This came to us uh, through our community development department, offers up not only the right things to do and uh, gives us kind of a path to get there, but it also opens up several grant opportunities available uh, should we meet the standards. I will move to approve that resolution. Uh, and oh, we'll, give this, second. we'll give the second to Keemer. <laughs> Discussion there. I actually have a comment. Go ahead. Um, one of the reasons I came back to Stevens Point to retire is because it's a great place to get old. <laughs> so I think this is a great step forward. And to all the folks that are working in bringing the city forward and doing the wayfinding signs, put miles on there so we know how long we're going to have to walk. <laughs> Because those are the kinds of things that make it, make easy choices for seniors. Can I walk that far to the river or should I just go over here to Great Northern Distilling? There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, you know, th those things I think will come with a resolution like this. And, you know, you want to bring the grandmas and the grandpas to town. So this is a good start. That is a great idea with the distance on the side. Make like sure that. she could walk back from the All right, any other comments? Hearing none, clerk, please call that roll. Christensen. Aye. Short. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And that's approved. Item number 13 is collateral assignment of a development agreement uh, for the banter mixed use building at 209 Division Street. Just as, as assignment of collateral. Director, do you want to say anything about this? You don't? More than happy to answer other questions. Okay. Anybody have questions for the director before we have a motion? If not, we'll move approval of the collateral assignment. Motion by Dalton. I'll second. Second by Keemer. Discussion. 
Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Morrow. Aye. Bishler. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Nebone. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Zerazua. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Shore. Aye. Christensen. Aye. And that is approved. Item number 14 is to award the 2022 road sur resurfacing project 22-02 to Haas Sons in an amount not to exceed $823,729.30. Motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Dalton, second by Fischler. Any discussion there? Hearing none, the clerk please call the roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. That is approved. Item number 15 is ordinance amendments to accept the amendments in chapter 9, sections 9.02. 9.05 and 9.06 as they relate to traffic signs. All tomorrow so moved. I'll second. second by Dalton. Discussion? Hearing none, clerk please call the roll. Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Zerazua. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Shore. Aye. Christensen. Aye. And that is approved. Item number 16 is discussion of possible action on the park donation agreement between the City of Stevens Point, General Capital, and the Sisters of St. Joseph, Third Order of St. Francis. This is to accept the park on the new um, convent development. Director? Just to reiterate, so in five years when the grotto is removed from the property that's included within this development, the, the donation agreement, um, it's been well vetted by the Sisters, the Parks Commission, and everyone else that's been involved as part of this, but expect in five or six years that the grotto will be removed as part of the overall development <coughs> plan for the park. And we're going to keep that sound bite and we're going to play it again in four years, <laughs> nine months, and 13 days. I hope they'll have more hair when that happens. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, you know, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, I'm going to take just a moment here. I forgot to mention John Quirk, our community media manager, celebrated 30 years with the city on Saturday. Um, and just this morning, we had uh, Sergeant Promotion, Justin Klein was promoted Sergeant, and Ben Eitenbrock was promoted to Lieutenant. And I apologize to those people because I missed that in my opening remarks. All right, do we have a motion? Motion by Zarazua. Approved. Seconded by Shore. A lot of things uh, in my district. <laughs> Any discussion? We do that. Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Zarazua. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Chuda. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Fischler. Aye. Morrow. Aye. And that is proof. I gotta tell you, I really love the fact that people are jumping in now to make the motion. <laughs> it was just like awkward silence for 30 seconds. All right. Uh, item number 17, the moment we've all been waiting for. The ordinance amendment, public peace and offenses against public policy to amend the deposit amount for possession of marijuana and possession of drug paraphernalia and quantity of possession of marijuana. We do have a few people wishing to speak. First one is Kevin Reuter. For those of you who don't know, Kevin Reuter was our assistant, or our former, former chief. police uh, chief of police. Yes, many a year ago now. It's a deadly forehand too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about this item uh, because from what I understand a request was made to make uh, marijuana more accessible to allow its use for medical purposes. Everything I've seen so far is the reason has nothing to do with the fine or the fine amount but it's about getting people access for their medical reasons. Although I sympathize and understand the basis of such a request, I do have a number of concerns to further decriminalize the use of this controlled sus substance at the city level. Most of us this past year, year and a half, have experienced the loss of a loved one during the pandemic and its cruelty as people were isolated, dying alone in a hospital in many cases. Making a drug more accessible can provide a perceived escape for recreational purposes because this ordinance change has nothing to do with just medical purposes. It also has, uh, involves people that would be using it for uh, recreational uh, ability as well and accessibility to those drugs is a two-way street for recreational users as well as people that want to use it for medical reasons 
The National Institute on Drug Abuse has noted a uh, remarkable increase of marijuana use since the pandemic. Uh, cannabis use disorder has been found to result in people more likely to contract COVID-19 and have more serious outcomes. The first year of the pandem pandemic, 99,000 drug overdose deaths in the U.S. with an increase of 30 percent. People are looking right now for an escape. Marijuana, I believe, and I've always argued this, is a gateway drug. It is a drug that is illegal and people are still striving to use it for purposes, mostly for purposes for recreational use. And people are, uh, are wanting a bigger high all the time with marijuana use, as noted with the fentanyl-laced marijuana that has caused many deaths in, in the United States as of recently. As that was 2020 numbers, unfortunately, 2021 numbers have increased over 101,000 overdose deaths, which is almost hard to believe. What you should know is the Wisconsin legislature is currently reviewing a bipartisan bill to address marijuana legalization for medical purposes. So this doesn't have to be a city level thing. This doesn't have to be a, an announcement to the public that marijuana use is okay. We're not going to, as uh, one of the older persons say, we're not going to enforce that. Wisconsin Medical Society right now opposes legislation noting that 60 plus cannabinoids in marijuana have not been well studied. So you should know that as well. Due to the shortage of time, let's look at one consequence of increased accessibility of marijuana use in the area of traffic safety. Fortunately, or unfortunately, we have a state to look at. Colorado is the first, one of the first states to legalize and decriminalize marijuana. Uh, in doing so, they just recently did a report from the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice. They did a report on the impacts of marijuana legislation, legalization, I'm sorry, in Colorado. The prevalence of marijuana or marijuana in combination identified by the Colorado State Patrol officers as the impaired substance in a DUI increased from 12% of all DUIs in 2014 to 31% in 2020. Citations noting marijuana alone increased from 6.3% 14 to 14, or I'm sorry, 8.7% in 2020. Uh, marijuana in combination with alcohol out of the drugs increased from 5.7% to 22.7%. This is the staggering part. Traffic fatalities where a driver tested positive for any cannabinoid increased 140%. By reducing the further fines for marijuana use to help make this illegal drug more accessible to those with a medical need is a big mistake with very sh and very short-sighted. It was noted in the Metro Times that Alderperson Christensen stated that this would put us on the cutting edge of Wisconsin. Bleeding edge is more like it. You want to be cutting edge, work to have legislation that addresses specifically medical marijuana usage and be a voice in Madison. Fight for what you know is right. The winner in your effort of passing this request are the drug dealers in the community getting more customers. Don't be fooled. The dealers have a myriad of product to offer their consumer. Finally, I want to end with a sad note. In the very front of this building, in the lawn is a picture of a young woman horribly taken from her family due to drunk driving. I know the mother very well. I'm saying to you, do not add another drug to impaired drivers in our community, especially not in these vulnerable days we live in now. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Joshua Rosencrantz. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, it's Thank you for uh, allowing me the chance to speak. The last time I spoke was about a week ago and I mentioned a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that justice delayed is quite truly justice denied. I think about this a lot in relation to this and what our former police chief just said. I find it fascinating that we are citing statistics of alcohol abuse, and I am well aware of the dangers. I mean, we are all 
Wisconsinites. We are quite truly the hardest drinking state in the entire of our blessed union. I believe Appleton wins the prize for most drunkest city in the entire nation. Alcohol places a tremendous burden on our healthcare system. But anyone who would step forward in front of this committee and try to provide those statistics as a means to criminalize alcohol as a misdemeanor and penalize it as a criminal offense would be laughed out of the courtroom, would be laughed out of, your, out of the council chambers. Because we've already tried it. We tried it in the 1920s and it didn't work. I think about justice denied and the sympathy that our former police chief said, but it worries me that we are now f coming to a, a disturbing point where we value the law more so than we value the lived experience of our neighbors and of our community members, where we disregard people like um, uh, people like Ben Colick, who suffer from leukemia, and countless others who suffer from leukemia and other terminal illnesses, children that I've worked with who suffer from autism and live in a sensory world vastly foreign to the ones that we inhabit, who don't have the option of abiding by the law. If we are going to live any constitutional values, what do we stand to gain by depriving others of their right to a quality or to a qualitative life? We don't gain anything and we're hurting ourselves. And the worst part is that we're hurting ourselves in the name of a good deed. And I found that wounds resulted from good deeds are the ones that hurt the most and cause the most damage. And I would, we are oft to blame in this. And with devotion's visage and pious action, we sugar or the devil himself. We commit the most grievous offenses in the, in the name of what is good. That's Shakespeare. We hold our, our, our morals higher than we do the uh, quality of life of others. And continuing to keep uh, cannabis uh, criminalized, quite frankly, is only hurting the most vulnerable among us. Yes, drugs can be used as an escape. Alcohol most certainly is used as an escape. Criminalizing that would be ludicrous. Criminalizing this drug, where there is medical literature which shows it has several benefits to people that suffer from cancer, from autism, that it has helped combat veterans who have served our union and served this state and served this community, are, are, are numerous. And simply passing this drug off as a gateway drug fundamentally denies these people their voice and I would argue flies in the face of reality because quite frankly, cannabis leading to heroin use is preposterous since heroin affects a completely different region of the brain, whereas cannabis affects the endocannabinoid system. I could stand here and talk for hours about and, and debunk all of these classical reefer madness claims. And I think the most disturbing part of all of that is I doubt it would persuade a decent amount of people who have already made up their minds. In that sense, I would ask those who believe contrary to this issue, who believe that this drug should be criminalized, I would ask that I would ask them to consider what you get out of it by denying people like Ben the right to their medicine. What does that give you? Does it give you peace of mind? Does it give you safety? Because I doubt, I highly doubt that denying a cancer patient, denying a combat veteran or a child with autism the right, their, I would argue their God-given right to their medicine, I doubt it does any good to you. And if anyone has convinced you that it does, they most certainly are getting something out of it, and I guarantee it ain't you. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Gillier. <clears throat> Corey Kelly, 1111 Minnesota Avenue. Um, I just wanted to get up here and talk because I think this whole thing is just so bizarre that, that we're here in 2022 having a discussion about how we should punish people for possessing or using plants. That's literally what this comes down to. 
and we're going to have this big debate about whether we should punish them with a hundred dollars or five dollars or maybe we should you know go back to locking people up in prison for the rest of their lives and it, it's it just boggles my mind that we're still doing this um you know ben comes up here and he talks about uh you know his cancer and stuff like that and and i you know why why should he have to do that like why does he owe anybody an explanation for why he wants to consume any plant. I don't care if it's a tomato or an apple or a cannabis bud. It doesn't matter. Uh, the idea that we're going to criminalize something that any one of us can easily grow in our backyard ju is just so bizarre. There's not, a, there's not a word in the English language to describe how absurd all of this is. Um, it was said at a committee that, and you know, again here, that this is a decision that should be left up to Madison. You know, let's let a, a bunch of self-interested parasites a hundred miles away make decisions for Ben. Why? That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you're here on the council to represent the people of Stevens Point, not Madison politicians. Uh, ben is here. He lives here. Uh, Madison isn't here. I think if everybody's so concerned that we uh, follow Madison's, you know, arbitrary little rules of plant prohibition, uh, Madison could come here and enforce those themselves. We're under no obligation to do this. I, I don't support the idea that we're going to punish anybody for consuming cannabis. Uh, and I am under no obligation to go along with any dumb law that says we're going to start doing that. Um, I don't know. I just I, I think it's so crazy. Uh, and I know a lot of people are making this a medical issue. But look, if I wanted to go home tonight and consume cannabis and watch Ross's Game Dungeon on YouTube, who are you to say I can't do that? Who is anybody to say I can't do that? Uh, why do I have to give any explanation to anybody for why I should have to do that? Um, I need to give no more an explanation for that or a justification than Ben does for using it for medical purposes. This is insane and ludicrous, and I know there's cops in here, so you know I'm just I'm just saying that as an example. It's not like I'm going to go home and do that or anything like that. Um, I I love the law, and there's nothing I love more than obeying the law. Um, but yeah, I, just, I think this is silly. I think this is nonsensical. $5 is too much. Let's stop issuing citations altogether. This is craziness. Thanks, Corey. Russ's Game Dungeon, huh? <laughs> ben? Hi, guys. <clears throat> ben Kalik, uh, 1372 North 2nd Drive, here in Stevens Point. Um, so the ordinance change is to update our laws to be current with what our residents uh, want and with what's already been done in 36 states across the country. There were talks of overdoses just a moment ago, right? So every state that's legalized marijuana so far, out of the 36, every single one of those states has seen a decrease in overdoses from opiates and other addictive medications. If your concern is overdoses, that is a perfect argument as to why we should be decriminalizing marijuana use. It helps fight the battle of overdoses. The discussion of medical marijuana versus recreational marijuana, that's one that it doesn't quite make a lot of sense to me because Think about the reasoning behind why anybody would choose marijuana, any adult. They're doing it after a long day of work because they have anxiety, they're depressed, they're having insomnia, they're having an eating issue like I've had. They're battling some life altering illness. There's a myriad of reasons as to why people decide, adults decide to use marijuana. All of them stem from a medical reason, whether it's a, a mental health benefit a physical health benefit, it's all for medical purposes. I don't believe that recreational is its own subset 
it's all medical if you think about it. Voters in Portage County were asked in 2018 if they were in favor of legalizing medical marijuana use, 83% of the entire county said yes. That's Portage County. I bet you that Stevens Point, that number is probably close to 90. We don't know that, but picture of the demographics of Stevens Point compared to the county. It's 83% countywide. That is what the people want. Uh, this is what the vast majority of residents want. Their message to you, City Council, it could not be made more clear. We have the numbers, we don't have to guess. You know what the will of the people is. Some may say that we should wait for the state to legalize marijuana. It should, I think we all agree in that. We heard that argument though in 2015 when I first worked with City Council and had the fine lowered from 300 to 100. The same arguments were made then. We should wait for the state. In 2018, we heard the same arguments. We should wait for the state. We've been waiting years and years with no signs of any progress. We can wait, that's a choice that we do have, or Stevens Point can be a leader in this effort. I believe this change will overall, almost done. I believe this change will overall improve the quality of life for the residents of our city, which is exactly what we should be keeping in mind when any important decision is being made. I believe this because I believe this because I've lived this. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I know we took some liberties and allowed some extra time for all of the speakers, uh, but I think this is important. Uh, we have some very good points on both sides. With that, need a motion? Uh, since I brought it forward for discussion, I will move to approve the ordinance as presented. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Dalton. Discussion? I'd like to speak if I could, Mayor. Alderman Carlson. You know, I first of all, I want to say I've really enjoyed the, the viewpoints here and the civil way that they've all been presented. And last week and again tonight, I heard the testimony about centering on medical marijuana. And actually, Ben, I think it's 83% of the state that wants medical marijuana. And I'm hopeful that someday that it will be legalized. Um, 37 states legalized marijuana in one form or another, be it medical. A handful are recreational as well. Uh, but in all those states, it's 21. And that's what I have the problem with this ordinance proposal. Uh, it says 17 years old. And we have a, a drinking age in the state of Wisconsin and in the city of Stevens Point, that's 21. I, uh, I just think we should also be status quo with an illegal drug as we are with legal things and make it a 21 age limit, not 17. Um, again, in some of these places where recreational drugs are used, Corey would be great. You know, as long as he's going home, sitting in his basement, smoking, he's fine. But you can't smoke in public places. Now, there's some exceptions in some states, some cities, where it's allowed in public places. But most, you can't smoke out in public places. We've already decriminalized marijuana in Stevens Point. Uh, I just don't understand why we're going to require someone to be 21 to buy a Miller Lite but 17 to have five grams of marijuana. That's not consistency. Uh, and another thing, Ben and everyone, I don't see the police department kicking down doors of people who are sick, who have anxiety, who are inside their homes trying to bust them for smoking weed in their house. I think we have to keep this in perspective a little bit. I really do believe, Ben, that the state is gonna legalize this. I think it's, and you know, I think in our conversations, you said it's the Republicans. Well, what I read is what Chief Reuter said. It's the medical society that's opposing it because of all the unknowns with marijuana. Um, 
I would like to make a motion to refer this item back to the committee for public policy and government to make changes to the ordinance to make it consistent at 21 rather than 17 if we're going to do this. Sorry, Alderperson Carlson. Uh, there's a motion on the floor already. If that, if that fails, we can then consider a new motion. <clears throat> okay. If you were to move to amend, I don't think an amendment is what you're going for, but an amendment would be in order, but a new motion is not until this motion is considered. Well, could I re restate that and say I'd like to amend this motion to reflect 21 years of age rather than 17? Yes, that would be in order. All right. <clears throat> and I'd also like to ask my fellow uh, alders we listen to the directors of the street department we listen to the the directors of uh, community development why aren't we listening to the police department why aren't we listening to a chief of police why aren't we listening to an assistant chief of police a retired chief of police I don't know if chief Cuso was going to speak or not but why don't we listen to them that's that's my only thing. thank you we have a motion on the floor to change the age from 17 to 21 is there a second I'll second that seconded by Keemer discussion only on the amendment at this point uh, President Johnson I see your hands up I assume you want to speak on the motion uh, overall rather than the amendment or do you have comments on the amendment I do not have comments on the amendment thank you mr. mayor okay Alder Fisher. Fisher. I was gonna call you Alder Keeley but that's kind of weird <laughs> So I, I do agree with this. Um, I think that 21 is a good age because I mean, you have to be 21 to drink. Um, you have to be 18 to smoke cigarettes. So I think that it's important to note um, that the age should be, I would think, higher than 17 in my opinion. And um, I do have another comment, but just on the general, the overall. Okay, thank you, and we can hold those for later. So um, I'm gonna go back to Alderperson Carlson. Um, it says age 17 or older, you want to change that to 21. So I, I assume the next paragraph you want to change to 20 and younger? Yes. Just so everything's consistent there. I, I just want to make that change so I note that in the amendment. Any other comments on the amendment? Good. You only have to be 18 to buy a firearm in the state of Wisconsin. 18. AR-15, anybody? Don't quite see. 21 for handguns. AR-15, 18. Hunting rifle, 18. Um, somehow I think that's a little bit more of a problem than somebody at age 18 smoking a cigarette or smoking, smoking a joint. Right now it's legal though. Okay, any other comments on the amendment? Alder Christensen. When I read through the, the draft ordinance in the packet, I, I too, was a little surprised by the 17 to be honest with you um, I had anticipated 18 um, and was actually looking to, to make an amend to propose an amendment to, to 18 um, I think 17 is definitely too young um, I'm not sure again at 18 you're legally an adult you are there are a number of various rights that that, that you're given at that point I think 17 is, is definitely too young. I, I know we have to vote on the amendment that's on the floor, but if, if that would fail, then, then I would be offering an amendment to change the age to 18. Thank you. Alder Zerzula? That's me, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> wondering if we can maybe hear from the city attorney why it's worded this way, why it says age 17 and older instead of age 18 and older. I think that would be appropriate. Uh, Attorney Beveridge, are you available? Uh, yes, I am, and I can tell you exactly why that is. It's because uh, as I was going through it, what I had in mind was the procedural rules for uh, citations and juveniles. And uh, under state law at 17, that is when you are treated as an adult for purposes of uh, uh, ordinance enforcement in general. Uh, so I was just thinking of it through that lens. It is uh, certainly uh, within the uh, powers of uh, this body to amend it as has been proposed. Okay, anyone else on the amendment? Okay, we're gonna vote on the amendment and I'm gonna do a roll call because I think it's gonna be split. So clerk, could you call the roll please? Sure, Morrow. Aye. Fischler. Um, aye. Felton. No. 
Shuda? Aye. Nebone? No. Carlson? Aye. Johnson? No. Zerazua? No. Keemer? Aye. Shore? No. Christensen? No. Six no's. The motion fails. Correct. I would uh, propose an amendment to, to change the age in the uh, ordinance to 18. And then subsequently the 17. And 17 the in, in the second paragraph. Motion is to change it to 18 and 17 respectively. Is there a second on that motion? Seconded by Dalton. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Discussion. Let's do a roll call quick on that one. Christensen. Aye. Shore. Aye. Keemer. Aye. Zerazua. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Carlson. I'll go aye. Kneebone. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Dalton. Aye. Fischler. No. Morrow. No. 9-2. Nine 9-2, two. Two. the motion passes. <coughs> Don't you love democracy? I do. It's a lot easier to sell. So the proposed ordinance change now reflects any person who is age 18 or older who violates any provision of this ordinance, and then section B under the penalty, any person who is age 17 or younger. Now we are back to the original motion as amended. And I'm gonna to go to President Johnson first, and then we will come back to Alderperson Fischler. President Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I'd like to agree with Alder Carlson that this has been a wonderfully um, civil conversation filled with a lot of good information. And while everyone's passionate about it, it's been very respectful. So it's such an honor to see see that. I just wanna mention, um, I, I worked domestic violence in 99, 2000, uh, in 2001, while I was in college, um, very part-time. But of the 14 women and the one man and, and their children that, that I was able to help navigate that process. Um, not one of them was drug related. In fact, all but one were, were alcohol related. Unfortunately, one was a terribly um, uh, disturbed individual, but the majority of them were alcohol related. It is our drug of choice in Wisconsin. As Mr. Rosencrantz said, we are, this is, this is what we do. I just want to relate, um, and I agree, the signs out front of that building that you're all sitting in now, it is dreadful to think <clears throat> what happens when people get behind the wheel of a car and drive impaired, most of which, unfortunately, is alcohol. I was at an event when I had moved back to Stevens Point after being gone for, I don't know, I guess I was gone for about 14 years. I grew up here, but I was at a, a, a very nice event. I won't say the name of the event, but there were many community members there. And a former sheriff was the coat check person. And as the event was winding down and my girlfriend and I were waiting for my daughter to come pick us up because we had a DD being responsible, um, the coat check person, the former sheriff, was handing very inebriated people their coats and their keys. We find a, 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 a comfortableness with alcohol because it's what we know. We feel we can create a predictability about the outcomes, but in fact, we can't predict the outcomes. So we want to try somehow say that marijuana is a gateway drug. I would argue that alcohol is indeed of the same level. Um, it leads to early childhood trauma. It leads to broken marriages. It leads to financial ruin. I mean, you can go on and on. So. It is, it is an unequal comparison, um, and, and I, I appreciate this discussion, and I appreciate the direction that we're going with this, um, and uh, to create some equity between those two things. So thank you very much, and thanks to everybody involved. Thank you. Sounds like Dash agrees, too. <laughs> Dash agrees as well. <laughs> Alder Fischler. Okay, so I just want to state that I don't disagree with the medical and marijuana use at all. Like I, I honestly can understand that and I have you know people that I've known and loved who have struggled through different various diagnoses that have you know turned to that as an alternative so um, the only place I disagree with is again the age because um, in the event of an OWI like if you're 21 um, you know you still have to deal with those consequences 
So I just feel really bad for people who are 18 and dealing with an OWI just by chance. So that's one thing that just doesn't sit well with me in that aspect of it. And then the other thing is that there's no way to really measure out the exact amounts of THC. Like we don't have any anything in place currently within our legislature or, or just within our community to uh, make sure that people are getting the proper dosages. So that's the other concern. So if someone's 18, not getting the proper dosages, then gets an OWI, you know, just as a, it just, it doesn't put them in a very good place starting out, you know, at a young age. So, you know, maybe people are just being totally responsible and aren't driving, that's great, but there's nothing in here that, you know, can prevent that from happening. So that's all I have to say about that, and it's just mostly the age, and then just no way of measuring the THC amounts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's been some discussion on that there has been no movement on this. I mean, SB 1034 was proposed on 420 by a Republican legislature, not by a bunch of libs, but from a Republican legislature. So, th so it is moving there. Um, I th and I think that we should get a hold of our reps, Patrick Tesson and Katrina Shanklin, to make sure that this does that this does pass. Um, if we pass this, I don't think it would be very fair because law sh should be fair for everyone. I mean, do you, depending if you're stopped by the sheriff's department, say a plover, highway patrol, or the or just from the UWSP police, you you could get totally you could get totally different fines, offenses, everything. And someone who thinks, oh, I just got an uh, I just got my first, you would still you could actually get a you could actually get a felony, and. The odds of that, I mean, someone says, well, that's never, going, that's never going to happen. Well, you never know. I mean, the laws should be fair for everybody. There's nothing in the ordinance just for medical marijuana. I think medical marijuana would end up being good. I think, I mean, I think that it should pass. And as the stats have said, 83% say that it should. And that message is slowly getting through. Three or four years ago, we would never even have this talk. This would not, have, this, this would not even be here. I mean, the way that this has moved has been like, incredibly fast. I mean, the attitudes towards weed from when I grew up, I mean, totally, dra I mean, totally drastically different. And I think that's, I think that's actually a good thing. Um, they, some have said that you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a, a, against the law to really consume a plant. Well, you can't grow, you, you mean, you can't grow your own shrooms. You shouldn't be able to grow your own plants for heroin for, so you can't really, do that. You can't grow the, the, the poppy plants to to make your own to make your own heroin. So that's one of the things you can do. I mean, and the basic thing is, though, the law is what the law is. Do you agree with all of the laws? No, but it is what it is, and that's why we have bodies to change that. That's why we elect our reps at the state level. I mean, you may not agree with what Madison does, but then you have to elect the people that you want in there to get the laws changed. For what you act for, what you want, I think it's inevitable that eventually medical marijuana is going to be here. You, I think, before I retire, full legalization. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, you just see it from state, from state to state to state, and the police do have discretion on what they end up doing. Um, I know when I started with the Department of Corrections, we used to revoke guys for to prison for a week. I mean, we never would think about doing that now, unless they had like tons and tons of it. But like, we just, I mean, that's just not, I mean, attitudes have changed. I mean, things don't, things never change as fast as you really want them to. Laws don't always change, but they do. And we're, and we're seeing, we're, we are seeing that here with SB 1034. That's exactly what's, that's exactly what's going on here. Um, and I think that if we do pass this, I mean, Depending on the luck or bad luck someone has, if they get pulled over with weed, I mean, it could be totally drastic, drastically different things just in the city. You, you could still be pulled over by the highway patrol, by the college, sheriff, and then, and then your outcome could be totally opposite of what you think it's going to end up being. I mean, I know the police and the college have their own ways of dealing with things, but still, that that threat is still there. And the law, if the, if the law is gonna change, it needs to change for everybody, not just 
by luck on who happens to hack, who actually happens to, to really pull them over. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, we'll go to Alder Zarazua. Um, okay. I have a question, first of all. So when we did the amendment to change it, did that also change this age in Section 4? That was the age, I believe, that was changed, Section 4. Penalty. So yes. The, There's two uh, sections. If, That's it, yeah, oh, I see. You see it's Section 4, not item number 4. But yes, they, mm -hmm. I, the, the motion would change both of those ages to 18 uh, and older and 17 or younger. Just making sure. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I can't believe this is still a discussion. Um, <laughs> so, I think it's fair to say that a person driving down the street who could still get pulled over, first of all, we don't want them driving while they're smoking marijuana. So, a person walking down the street who has been smoking could be stopped by the sheriff's office okay so does that mean that we can't change an ordinance because it might not be fair like why can't we change it and say again where we then talk to our elected officials county board supervisors and say hey this is something you guys should look at maybe we should all be working to move in the same direction to show that the county as a whole or Portage or Plover and you know all of our municipalities are all on board too. I, I don't feel that the other municipalities not making a decision on this is a reason for us to not make a decision. Like we wouldn't get anything done ever. <laughs> like I, I'm sorry, that's like saying like the speed limit's 30 here and then you cross the line and it's 35. Oh no, we can't do that. Like we just can't make laws that way. Um, so I, I think that as a body, we, we are a body that's here to make decisions. So to just keep saying put it to the state is not, that's not reasonable. I think we're, we're not changing whether or not it's legal. Again, we're just changing how much we're charging for it. And that's it. I, I think charging $5 is the lowest we would go and sorry Corey <laughs> and I would never have thought I was agreeing with Corey on anything so thank you, <laughs> thank you. any older person who has not yet spoken Ron I'll get back to you okay I don't know if I have or not um no you haven't not on this one I'm writing it down <laughs> going by what Alder Morrow just said he said the Police have discretion. Well, that's not, then you're not dealing the same way with everybody. If I get stopped for speeding, I might get a ticket. I might bat my little eyelids and get off. You might get stopped and you might get a ticket. How is that fair? The law is not being applied fairly. That's not a good argument to use, I think, that um, because one municipality has it and they won't use the same discretion I mean, I'd like to see everybody at speeding get stopped, but that's that's just that's, that's just me. Yeah, that's just me. But I think, well, a couple of things I, I noticed. You don't have to go very far to get legal marijuana. You can go to Michigan or Illinois. In 2021, Michigan brought in 111 million dollars in tax revenue, and that was just on the use tax. That didn't even count the sales tax. Illinois brought in 400 million. Can you imagine what the state could do with that kind of money for roads and education and treatment for drug and alcohol abuse from people that have issues with meth and heroin and alcohol, which I think is a far greater problem in society. And I will admit alcohol was my drug of choice. I've been sober for 44 years. Um, last Thursday. <laughs> so I understand addiction. Um, I under, I mean, I should have been stopped and inter intervened a long time before I finally did get help. But had there been places available like this, funded by tax dollars, maybe from alcohol sales, might have helped a lot of people a lot sooner than, than some of us um, might have made better choices early on in our lives. But in the end, it all works out. Um, I think, as Alder Zarazua said, we're just lowering the amount of the fine. We're not making it legal. 
but I would encourage the state not to turn down their tax money. <laughs> we have a lot of needs in the state, and that ta those tax dollars could go a lot, a long way to make life better for a lot of people, including addicts and if people with issues like that. So anyway. Be careful by reducing the fine, you're actually reducing the revenue. Oh, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> what are you thinking of that? Yeah. Uh, let's see, Alder Kemer, and then Alder Christensen, did you want to speak as well? Briefly, yes. Okay, so Kemer, then Christensen. So this will be brief too. I just wanted to reiterate something that I heard Alder Zarazua say, which is, you know, the municipality mm -hmm. cannot change the legality of this. We cannot make it permissible. What we can do is make a policy decision to level the fines based on a collective sense of the severity of this citation. And I think ideally, the level of a fine reflects the threat, you know, the, the crime or citation is to an individual's health, the threat it is to someone's safety, the danger it poses to others, the potential harm it causes the environment and the community. And so I think what we are seeing from the public, you know, throughout the country in the state and central Wisconsin is that recreational individual use does not pose a huge threat to an individual's health and safety um, in the environment. And that we are simply making a policy decision that more accurately reflects the level of threat, um, not making a decision on the legality um, whatsoever. Thank you. Alder Christensen. She just made my first part of the point, and the second part of the point I was going to, to mention is one of the con concerns that's been expressed is, is the inability to, to know the potency of the THC. And you don't have any kind of quality control in our existing, and that's why I do hope that they do take some action at the state level, because then you are able to, to have much more quality control, and, and the chances of, of somebody being adversely affected, and before it happened, uh, unexpected, I've never tried it, so I, I have zero experience with it. But when you when you when you, <laughs> when you can't the basement after the meeting. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't no. inhale. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I do think it's going to be an advantage when they can actually control the the quality of, of what the person's consuming, and then they can there can be the studies that will take place, and and I think everybody will benefit in the long run. So. Great. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak for the first time? Last call. Okay, Alderman Carlson. Just uh, concerning the revenue portion, the current bill calls for a 10% uh, tax on the medical marijuana coming through. But, and also I was gonna mention to Ben, if you haven't contacted her, please contact her. She's a representative from Irma, Wisconsin, a cancer survivor. I think that would be good. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say, what Mary said, in 32 years of being a police officer, I have seen more families destroyed by alcohol, more people hurt by alcohol, more fights starting over alcohol, definitely because it's out there. Um, I'm just worried about the message, I guess. The message that we send to the citizens of Stevens Point, we're making it $5 for an illegal substance at the state level. And that's where I'm stuck on. I wish we could tax the heck out of it, like your quote in the paper. I, th I think it was heck, wasn't it? But yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. But I wish we could tax it, control it, prescribe it, help it. Um, but I'm going to have to stick to my guns. As it is a statewide legal, illegal thing, I'm worried about the message we send to the community. Uh, for, with a $5 fine. I think we've already decriminalized it enough and people pay more for a cell phone bill than the current fine now, you know, so that's that's my two cents and I'm done. Thank you. I just wanted to say we have a noxious weed ordinance. You will get a $100 fine if you have noxious weeds growing in your yard. <laughs> <laughs> in my yard. But the closet <laughs> is a whole thing. In your yard. All right. Um, the motion is to approve the ordinance amendment as amended. If you are in favor, vote yes. If you are opposed, vote no, and the clerk will call the roll. Morrow. No. Fischler. No. Felton. Aye. Shuda. Aye. Kneebone. Aye. Carlson. No. Johnson. Aye. Zerozua. Aye. Kemer. Aye. Shore. Aye. Christensen. Aye. Eight three. Yes. Motion is adopted. Before we do our final thing. Cormac, you've been sitting there so diligently all evening. 
would you do me the honor of coming up here, proclaiming meeting adjourned, and, and hammering the gavel? Can I say one thing? Absolutely. One second. We're going to let um, Chief Cuso speak. This isn't published till June 24th, right, Corey? <laughs> It's published June 24th. I just want to put this out there. Um, first of all, some mis misconceptions on this. Obviously, we decriminalized it uh, back in 2015 with Ben's help um, to five grams. 25 grams is a lot of marijuana. Um, as Alderperson Murrow says, um, officers do have discretion. My officers will have discretion on this. But we're going to look at the totality of the incident. So just because you have 20 grams of marijuana on you does not necessarily mean you will get a city ordinance. We're going to look at the totality. So if they're involved in some other type of criminal activity, they will be charged criminally. Um, and as Alderperson Carlson stated, I've been here 25 years. We've never, ever hit a door of an individual that's using it for medicinal purposes or personal use. The individuals that we've actually gone and arrested are the individuals that aren't good people, that they bring it into town and they sell it. Um, we have to get a lot of information and a lot of facts together before we can actually get a search warrant for a house. Um, so I just want to clear up those misconceptions on it. The other thing I'd like to say is the passion that you guys have shown here today, I hope that you go to the state level and show that to them as well. Because again, here, the 25 grams for $5, it's decriminalizing it. But just to get it here is a crime. Wisconsin State Patrol is overseen by the governor. So you can go to Illinois, you can go to Michigan, but when you transport it into Wisconsin, State Patrol doesn't have any choice. If they pull you over and they find marijuana, 25 grams in your vehicle, you will be arrested. So I would encourage all of you to go to the state level with your passion that you showed today. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right, Cormac. <laughs> Put your hand and down. Say man. meeting adjourned as loud as you can. <laughs> Perfect. Hey. 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 A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos. 